ask you, go back to the moment you're told you're going to play Lear. What is the first set of things you do? The first set of things I did was to find out the hours that elderly people could use the pools in my local swimming pool, because I was really scared that I didn't have either the physical or the vocal strength for it. And so I used to get up every morning, walk down the hill to the swimming pool, and there is a big kind of Olympic-sized pool. And then there's the smaller one, which is where they teach children to swim. But the elderly and the disabled are allowed to use it from seven until nine. And so I would get in the pool with my fellow elderly <laughs> swimmers. And it was really marvelous. It was like a kind of elderly United Nations, do you know what I mean? There we all were and we'd be chuntering away and swimming and walking and it was great. So that was the first thing, to get myself physically in shape, as I thought. Because it's a, gru it's a grueling... Do you know what's really fascinating about it? But this is true for all, I think, great plays, and there's no question that this is a great, great play. There is an energy in these plays, and if you manage to tap into that, it just carries you along, like a kind of jet plane or something. And um, it, that is extraordinary and very unique. And when you touch that energy, is it, do you go back to your old copy of Lear? Do you get a brand new copy? It's not something that, it, in a curious kind of way, obviously comes out of the written word, but that energy is dependent on everybody in the play. It's not a, a separate experience. It's, we are all responsible for the whole play whether the part is large or small. And untapping that energy is when we're all able to do it without you know, saying, you know, turn the switch on, it's your turn. I mean, it just happens. You've said that you can't survive with an ego on the stage. Is that why? Because it's a group? Well, it was one of the things, the first things that I was taught when I was being regularly employed. I mean, my great sort of breakthrough was working for Peter Brook, who's probably the greatest theatrical director of this or any other century. Um, and he works always from the basis that the total is greater than the sum of the parts. That means everybody. And is there a production to be found? And he expects everybody to help him on that exploratory trip. And so the first thing you had to leave outside the rehearsal room door, or your dressing room door, was your ego, because there's no place for that. One of the shocking things for me when I was a member of parliament was, I saw these people going up and down the corridors of parliament with egos which would not be tolerated for 30 seconds in a professional theater, and just wouldn't. And look at what we're doing now. I mean, what has happened to these people? Anyway. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm thinking about our particular struggle with Brexit at the moment, where the country has voted to leave the European Union. And obviously, it's not being covered as extensively here in, in America as it's being covered in my country, but you do get television re reportage from the chamber of the House of Commons. And I sit there, and I look at these people, and I know them, and I've worked with them, and I think, well, I can't swear, but I would like to. Um, what has happened to you? What are they th do they think they're doing? Because they're doing nothing. And if we crash out of Europe, well, you know, what is going to happen to our economy and our country? And it's just amusing and bewildering to me. Do you find yourself wanting to address the right honorable gentleman and, and revert back to your... Uh... No, I wouldn't want to be there. I mean, I'm in that happy position where I can sit outside and just bitch at them, which I do. But I do think the way our prime minister has been treated, both by her own party, and obviously mine, but also by in a sense, the political journalism in my country at the moment. There she is, slogging away, the only, as somebody said to me, the only adult in the room, as far as we're concerned, and she's being treated abominably, and she still is trying to deliver what the country has told our parliament they want to happen. And I don't agree with the country, but nonetheless, that's the democratic decision. And the country... Told, uh, spoke with that voice, but that was not necessarily her position, so she's carrying out something that she oh, wasn't. Oh, no, no. I mean, she's a Romainer, as I'm a Romainer, but her job as the Prime Minister of the country is to deliver what the country has told Parliament it wants to happen to us. I think they're wrong, but nonetheless, that's the democratic decision. 
I read that you said you saw Brexit coming 10 years before it. Oh, a long time before that, actually, because the underlying problem, well, reason, I think, and it's not exclusive to Brexit. You see it being exhibited across the whole of Western Europe, and that is immigration. The, the rest of the world being, you know, and these people flooding into Europe to live. I mean, let's face it, they're not... I mean, their own countries can provide them with nothing but death and destruction. But that was, the, I think, is the basic reason for this. And people simply, you know... I would get from when I was still a member of Parliament, my constituents complaining um, about immigration and, you know, their kids couldn't get into the schools they wanted, their kids couldn't get the houses, the NHS was being crucified. None of those things had anything really to do with immigration or certainly being part of Europe. They were the exclusive responsibility of the British government of the day. So when in my opinion, mistakenly, Mr. Cameron introduced a referendum. People used the free movement of peoples, which is one of the basic principles of the European Union, as a reason why their own lives were not as they wanted them to be. And that's one of my reasons, my interpretations of why we are where we are. Tell me what advice surgery is. It's something that all members of parliament hold. I used to hold one um, every week in, in different parts of my constituency, but always pretty much in the same place in those different parts. And you go along in the afternoon, it was always Friday afternoon, Saturday morning for me, and your constituents come to see you and they have problems and things of that nature. And it was so revelatory for me that, because someone would come into that room, never seen them before in my life, they didn't know me, and they would lay their life out on the table in front of you. And they come to you because nine times out of 10, the Member of Parliament is the port of last resort. And the other thing that was so humbling, actually, um, you would do your best, obviously, to try and help them. And sometimes you got the result that they wanted and sometimes you didn't. But they all always said thank you. That, you know, amazing. You've talked about egos and acting. In one point I read, you said that you have to stay in touch with people and the regularness of life to, to, with acting. Is that the case? It makes you a good member of parliament. Does it make you a good actor? Well, I wouldn't, I don't know. Well, I think it, it, I don't know whether it made me a good member of parliament. It's very, again, revelatory when you want to be a member of parliament. You know, the shoe is very much <laughs> on the voter's foot and they know where to place it if they're so inclined. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I've, in a way, I feel I'm blessed in as much as the, the socioeconomic group I come from was, it was very simple. If you didn't work, you didn't eat. And so I have been blessed with a strong work ethic, and I value that very much. Tell me about your parents, because you learned that from them, yes? Well, for example, my father, who I think went to sea when he was 12, and um, obviously there was the war when he was in the Navy, and then when he came back, um, he was a bricklayer. And my mother, I'm the eldest of four daughters, um, and, you know, she was the mum of, of four, four daughters. And when during the war, of course, when all the guys went, I mean, the women ran everything, didn't they? And then when the war was over, they were told, go away, it's okay, fine, the men have come back. Oh, really? Anyway, um, but I was very fortunate in that respect, in that we lived very close, certainly to, well, both my paternal and maternal grandparents. And so there was that supportive family around. Um, and I mean, when I went off to do my audition, hopefully, to get a place at RADA, which I did, which is the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Um, my mother thought she was never going to see me again because I'd be sold to white slavers, you know. I mean, it was that kind of <laughs> a very close family and a very, in a way, a close community. I mean, there was nothing that I or my sisters could have got away with. I mean, for instance, if we decided we didn't want to go to school that day, 
within 30 seconds, my mother would have known that because somebody would have said to her, hey, Joan, I've just seen your girls walking down the street. Why aren't they at school? Are they not well or something? Boom, you know, big explosion. And you carry that into your work today, that ethic? I think, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Usually, I mean, you haven't done it, and I hope you won't, because I'm going to give you a, a warning here. You know, it, interviewers will say about the play, um, is it fun? Are you enjoying it? And my immediate response is, it's work. What do you mean? You know, it's work. <laughs> and when I think of all those years that I pursued work and didn't get it. You, know. you also at one point said, if you have anything left after a performance, you haven't done it right, is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. If you, if you take anything home, then why have you taken it home? The place to leave it is the stage. Yeah, absolutely. Which means at the end of a show, you are feeling what? Well, oddly, still very energized. I mean, my worst day is my day off, um, when I feel absolutely wasted. And that's because <laughs> the, you know, the, the kind of the whole, we talk about Dr. Theater, I think it's true. Because it, you know exactly where you have to be, you know what your duty no, is? No, or? no, it's not that you know exactly, you don't in a funny kind of way. I mean, for me, every performance is the first performance. And I think that's true, I would certainly most of the actors I know. Um, and you have to find it then. You can't, you know, it's not, it's not as though you've got it in your pocket and you can take it out in a little package and unwrap it and say to the audience, here, why well, is the audience? You know, here's the perf, here's the play. You have to find it. Is that terrifying? Every, every time? Every you... night. I did a play with a wonderful actress called Mona Washburn. And we did this play. She played my aunt in this play. And she was in her late 60s, early 70s, I think. And every performance, the play opened, when the curtain went up, she was sitting on the sofa, I was sitting on the chair there. And every performance, she would sit on the sofa and she would say, please God, let me die. Please God, let me die. Please God, let me die. The curtain went up, boom, there she was, just superb. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, we are sadomasochists, I've decided. You know, we do it, but we torture ourselves at the same time. And is that the only way it can be as good as it is? I Well, I wouldn't want to go that far. I mean, because, you know, actors are all individuals. I mean, we're not carbon copies of each other. But it would worry me if I wasn't frightened. Yeah, it really would. Because writers are the ones who think they're the ones who are the sadomasochists who have the hard life. Well, it's a lonely life, I'm sure. I still don't know why contemporary dramatists find women so boring. They never write, it seemed to me, a play where a woman is the central dramatic engine, but we live in hopes. Mind you, I've been hoping for a very yeah. long time. Well, and, and so as you were coming up as an actress, mm. what, what, uh, what kinds when of roles I did When I left they? drama school, the then director of the drama school, who was himself a very, very, very good theatrical director, said to me, I was then, what, 20? He said to me, don't expect to work much before you're 40 because you're essentially a character actress. And that was a very accurate uh, miniaturization of what British theater was like at that time. It was still pretty much um, a theater in which you had male and female. It, it was essentially middle class, I think. Uh, but then, of course, the whole of British theater changed because John Osborne wrote Look Back in Anger. And suddenly, accents other than received pronunciation were permissible. Um, people that didn't have kind of safe lives in that way. And of course, television also began to exert, not a hold, but open up new doors for dramatists. And that's where, you know, it was good timing as far as I was concerned. You talked about the sadomasochism of acting. Um, Talk about what it was like going to all of those calls for actors in those uh, Well, I days. never, ever got a job from an audition. Um, and, a, a, you know, you'd walk in and they'd look at you, you'd prepare yourself, and they'd say, oh, sorry, darling, you're too tall, too short, you're blonde, you're brown, whatever, whatever, and you, out you would go. And that, to begin with, that sense of, re of personal rejection is very powerful and very upsetting, but over time you realize that it isn't personal. Um, 
And then, yeah, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of luck. This to me has always uh, been a paradox and you can solve it for me, which is on the one hand, you have to give everything in a performance. You have to be emotionally available. Meryl Streep says your pores have to be open to the audience. Mm. All of that vulnerability and then you go through auditions like that mm. and it's... Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. I don't know how, to, how one can be both. Well, you are. I mean, you can and you do. I mean, obviously time and experience help there. But I mean, to look at the positive side of it, I mean, well, I'm, I'm obviously from England. And in the main, it's a myth that we're totally socially retarded and it takes forever to get to know anyone in English. It isn't true. But there is a kind of pattern of behavior that, is, that you go through when you meet people, you know, socially. You don't have time for that with actors. You have to go, and we all do. You go to a level which is below that. You may loathe each other, but it doesn't really deter from, from knowing that you have to find that other source, um, which, is, which is the character and the character you're working with and that, and that kind of thing, and that's amazing. Why do British audiences not do standing ovations in Americans you're, do? Well, we do now. <laughs> I mean, I told them off once. It wasn't a way I performance, but <laughs> I do open my big mouth too much sometimes. I don't know, I mean, but then you see, when I, the very first play I did here in New York, I came with the Royal Shakespeare Company. 1970. I, was it 1970? And it was, the short title is The Marisade, which had been a big success in, in London. And when we'd done that play in London with the Royal Shakespeare Company, we had played it, this was every performance, without a sound from the audience until they went crazy. They had no standing ovation, I hate to know how, but you know, they applauded. We do our first performance here in New York, and it was a play that had music in it and songs. So the first song goes through, bravo, encore, encore. What, what? <laughs> we were getting laughs. We were getting, yes, very dead silences. But we all came off that stage saying, what's the play we're doing? What's the play we're doing? What, what are we doing here? Because American audiences are so immediate in their responses and, and in a way I think it's, I find it very, not always marvelously helpful, but helpful because in a funny kind of way they want you to know they're there and they, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And the, the, the best theatrical performances are always when you know, you've got all those strangers sitting in the dark and then strangers come in from the light and, and energy goes from the light to the dark. And if it works, that energy is returned to you. And so it goes throughout the night. And if it really works, it's a kind of model for me of an ideal society, you know, that, that shared and strengthened. So is it that the play doesn't exactly take place on the stage, it takes place in some space between the stage and the audience? Oh, well, I wouldn't... No, ideally, that space isn't there. I mean, there is, obviously, yes. that kind of space because there's a respect on both sides. We don't have footlights anymore, do we? I mean, if that's something else that's gone. But, I mean, there is, that, hopefully, there is that kind of respect which is shared between the two. But when the play really works, it, it, is, it is a unique and powerful experience. You were talking earlier about the feeling that you're doing it for the first time. Is the... Uh, is well, the, we are. We haven't played to that audience before. Right. Is the Olivier story uh, of him oh. going back, is that a true story? Well, was... I've heard it so many times and I see no reason to doubt it. it uh, what is extraordinary in many ways is it was when he was doing Othello, when uh, the National Theatre was still at the Old Vic, had moved to its present building. And the play had been in the repertoire for some time. But this particular night, he was being particularly brilliant. And to an extent, you know, the actors were in danger of missing their cues because they didn't want to leave the wings to see what he was doing. The audience, of course, goes crazy at the end. And everybody's saying, oh, isn't that marvelous, isn't that marvelous? He's heard swearing, breaking up his dressing room. And eventually, somebody said, well, you know, we've got to find out what's wrong. So they sent the youngest, ASM probably, to knock on his, so she knocks on the door, bless her, and um, 
And she goes in and she said, oh, you know, um, Florence, we were really rather worried because you were absolutely marvellous. And he said, I know, but I don't know why. And there you have it. <laughs> why? <laughs> this night is not every other night, every night. <laughs> Tell me about power as you saw it in politics and as you see it in the play. It's difficult to make a direct analogy there because the power that is in the play of King Lear um, is at a time where democracy was not anything that anybody thought about. I mean, power was passed down bloodlines or it was taken by murderous events. As far as King Lear is concerned, he has inherited his country. He's a man who no one has ever said no to in his entire life, which is the reason for the tragedy unfolding. The power of being a member of parliament is a myth, really, because as an individual, you don't have that power. You have a power on behalf of other people. I mean, certainly, um, as a member of parliament for a constituency and your constituent, we talked about our advice surgeries, come to you with problems, your letters will be answered, people will respond to your phone calls. As I've said, you don't always get the result that the individual wanted. But a sense of personal individual power is simply not the case. And one of the the powerful things, actually, about being in Parliament is when that sense expresses itself, less in the votes, because they're always, well, they were, they're not anymore, um, predictable over a specific piece of legislation, or even when you're, you know, in, in a committee examining a bill line by line, you pretty much know how things are going to swing, because it's embedded in a party political manifesto, which you, you know, campaigned on to hopefully get your party into power. But there, of course, is that power which is, I was about to say, outside Parliament itself. It isn't at the moment because we have a very, um, I mean, John per Berko is a man who is a firm believer, he's the speaker, um, in the power, in affording backbench MPs the opportunity to actually question the government of the day. And also he's been very innovative in changes to the, the actual place itself to encourage and make easier, um, you know, the population of the United Kingdom to actually get into um, their parliament. But the exercise of power in that sense is not something that one has any real sense of being. Um, I mean, even when I was the lowest form of ministerial life when we were in government in the Department of Transport, that was not a sense that I had until <laughs> and there was one airline, I can't remember what it was, which we had as a country said, no, you've got to do this before we let you land again. And we'd received the deputations and all that kind of thing. And um, I said, well, and when all that said over, I said, well, you know, they seem to make a very good case of it. And my personal secretary, who was appointed from the civil service and didn't come from the party, said to me, well, yeah, but, you know, if it crashes, it's all down to you. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of wakes you up a bit. <laughs> yes. None of the power and all of the responsibility. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got into politics to push back against uh, Margaret Thatcher. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Did you feel like when you were done with your political career that you had achieved what you set out to do? Well, in as much as we were in government from 97 for, you know, three sessions. But take, for example, one of the things that really, I mean, it still makes me furious, was she introduced the idea that you could buy your council flat, your social housing, um, if you'd lived there for a certain number of years. It was a, usually at a price way below the market value. Great. So we're now looking at a situation where it is absolutely impossible, nine times out of ten, for the people, I mean, I use London as an example for most metropolitan cities in my country, where it's virtually impossible for the people who make those cities run to find a 
a home they can afford to rent, a million miles away from a home they can afford to buy, and it all stems from that. And I'm not excluding my own party from criticism here, because even when we were in government, although we did increase the amount of building for what we call social housing in that sense, it certainly doesn't meet the need. And so now we're seeing yet again, you know, people sleeping on the streets and all that kind of stuff. And the basic view that she had of what was the way forward for my country was to me total anathema. She said once, what did the suffragettes ever do for me? Hang on, girl. Um, you know, that there's no such thing as a society. I think there is, and I think it's the duty of all of us to try to make those societies work and function properly, and we get on together. Are you optimistic about the wheel of society, that it tends always towards positive or negative? I think it goes round, um, certainly. I mean, I'm looking at Western European democracies, and I wonder, what, well, I look at my own country, and I wonder what we're doing, and I wonder what they're doing. And at a time when it seems to me the world should be concentrating more and more on how we communicate well with each other. We are basically the same envelopes, you know, human beings. Cut me and I bleed, to misquote. Um, I, and, you know, this, this idea that something is achieved by separating or putting up barriers or... I, I just don't get that. And I, I hope, yes, that the world... I look towards the younger generations to, to say, no, look, where we're going is, is not right. And that's one of the interesting things about this play I'm in. I mean, he is the most contemporary dramatist there is. But, you know, we have a lot in my country about millennials who are the younger generation, who they're looking at their future and they're saying, you know, it's not going to be like it was for our parents. And he's saying in, in his play, there's a young guy saying, we only get the money when they're dead and then we're too old to enjoy it. And you think, hang on, hang on. <laughs> it's just extraordinary. You said Shakespeare really asks three questions. Absolutely. Who are we? What are we? Why are we? And no one's come up with sufficiently comprehensive answers. So I suppose we'll all keep on asking those questions. You mentioned how playwrights are not writing roles for women. What roles are being written for women in politics? I think there has been a major shift there in many ways. Um, but if I look at the example of my own country, for example, the prospective parliamentary candidate, the person you choose in your constituency party, um, I think certainly the Labour Party has said that there have to be, you know, women candidates. Um, obviously, the Liberal Democrats have as well. Conservatives are kind of a bit on, on the fence about it. But it has to really start at that kind of grassroots level. I know when we, the Labour Party, introduced the idea of all women candidates for prospective parliamentary candidate. A lot of the constituency parties were outraged. And so a lot of sent out, you know, saying, look, this is a comparatively good idea, very good idea. And the constituencies that I went to, they all said the same thing, that they had never seen candidates of such equal ability as the all women shortlists. Because, you know, it was like everything. It was the old boys' network, you know. Oh, he's the next one up the ladder. And they were really surprised by that. And that's very positive, I think. And we are seeing more and more women around the world, not just in Western European democracies. But there are still, there's a basic, basic, I think, gate that yet has to be opened. And that is that women can not like each other. I mean, actively, positively dislike each other. But they can sit around a table and concentrate on a problem that requires solution and come up with a solution. I remember when I was first elected and um, there would be these committees. I mean, 92, more women elected that year than ever before. But you'd be on a committee and there'd be, what, three token women and nine others are all guys. And I can't remember what we were discussing this particular day, but one of my colleagues put, female colleagues, put forward this idea, and all the guys went, oh yeah, very interesting. 10 minutes later, one of the guys came up with the same idea, and they all said, oh, that's very good. My colleague said, 
not the one who put the ad out. Hang on a minute, she said that 10 minutes ago, and you saw all these faces going down the table, oh, women don't, they drive you mad, you know. <laughs> a lot of things in those kinds of areas we have to change. The most fundamental is get out and vote. I mean, that's the thing, get out and vote. You talked about how women could be on opposite sides, but they come to an agreement. Absolutely. In America, there is extraordinary polarization. People who believe have different ideologies cannot talk to each other. You have a son who's a conservative. Well, yes, he is. When he told me, I, I mean, he's a political journalist, and certainly the newspaper that he writes for is um, further to the uh, right than I would feel comfortable with. Um, but in a funny kind of way, what am I trying to say here? I mean, I did say to him when he told me, um, well, I'm going to have to, well, I said that about Brexit, well, I'm going to have to emigrate then. But of course I didn't. Um, but it is possible still, within the context of, of our family, to have discussions which are poles apart. But then that's been my experience with him all my life. I mean, he's always had a mind of his own and you know things like that. What does amaze me is people I know well who, I mean, and it is the Brexit deal that's done it, they cannot speak to other members of their family. And you think, my God, I mean, you know, because there's simply no meeting of minds on. I don't know where we're going, but. What do you make of people who want to compare, bring Donald Trump into a conversation about Lear? <laughs> I'd like to see him try. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but people who see Donald Trump or or when they are watching Lear they think uh, they think of a of, but of, Lear isn't like Donald Trump he doesn't he has no self pity um, he doesn't really have fear he's basically honest he has a strong sense of responsibility um, where he's flawed is that he. As I say, no one ever said to him, no. And it's only towards the end of his life that he suddenly realizes, and, and he frankly admits it, you know, I'm not perfect. He doesn't use those words. Shakespeare used far better language than I do. But no, no, there's no similarity there. I mean, there's a difference between an, a sense of absolute power, which he does have, and egomania. He's, he's not in that sense an egomaniac. I mean, it just amazes him that, you know. It's almost a sin to ask this question, but to, with a play of this size mm. and scope. But what does Lear mean to you at its center? I have to approach it, sorry to go back to my advice surgery days, but one of the requirements, duties, respons well, not responsibilities, but one of the things that was most interesting was visiting old people's homes, day centers, things of that nature. And as we get older, and we are, I mean, as a species, living much, much longer than our parents, for example, did, those absolute boundaries, those barriers, which define our genders, begin to fray. They begin to crack. They begin to get a bit misty. And that, I think, is what I have found in a, in a curious kind of way, most useful in doing Lear is, is that he, he does begin to go down that path. I mean, suddenly emotions that he's probably never thought about. I mean, the most, the clearest one for me is where he castigates himself for not taking care of the poor. I mean, he just, probably for the first time in his life, admits failure I, and <laughs> It's painful. I mean, it really hurts him. And so that I found, you know. I want to go back again and ask you about this, the fact that women are not written for. Um, why, why do we think that is? I don't know. I find it very curious, and I've been finding it curious, really, for a very, very long time, because I see no marked change in that. Why? There have been enormous changes in women's lives, um, some of them great, some of them not so great. And there is still room, for, I'm not arguing that we are by any means equal, because we're not. But there have been major strides made. 
And yet, contemporary dramatists, it seems to me, still don't find women interesting as characters. We are rarely, if ever, the central dramatic engine. And when I put up this moan before, people say, oh, no, no, you know, there are lots of women writers now. No, come on. It always is. It still remains that if a woman is successful, whatever she chooses to do, she is the exception that proves the rule. If she fails, well, we told you they were all failures. And that basic untruth, I don't see fracturing or cracking or becoming frayed around the edges as far as contemporary dramatists are concerned. And it puzzles me. I don't know why they find us so boring. Have you ever thought about writing a play? I couldn't write a postcard. I swear to you, I could not. Why? I don't know. I mean, my brain, I like to think my brain moves too quickly um, and my hand can't catch up, but I'm sure that isn't true. I mean, because when I have said that, people say to me, well, then record it. And I said, then I'd be talking to myself. And we all know what that's the first sign of. <laughs> Is Lear in your head as a character during the day, on your day off, say? Are you in touch with Lear? I wouldn't say as a character, no. Um, but there is always something that says, oh, you better not eat that in case you should, you know, or no, no, you can't have a drink and all that kind of stuff. There is that sense of responsibility for the envelope that is going to hopefully find Lear to be as good as it can be. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, as I, I said earlier, I mean, we are all responsible for this play and in a kind of curious way, I am as dependent upon all the characters, as I would hope they are, of mine. And it is undoubtedly the case in Shakespeare. You often learn more about your own character from what other people say or do than what he actually gives you to say. But that's life, isn't it? God, the guy was a genius. Honestly. Do you realize he wrote Lear, the Scottish play, and Antony and Cleopatra all in the same year? And he was at the end of his life. Right? And I have seen, I think, was it the first or second folio of Antony and Cleopatra because I did it years ago. And there's one full stop in that script. And it's after the last word of the play. One full stop. This guy writing with candlelight and quill pens. Thank you, William. <laughs> Do you, would, you talked earlier about preparing for the play, going mm -hmm. to swim, mm -hmm. going to the... And also, when you went uh, as a part of your, when you were um, in Parliament visiting um, the elderly, mm. do you identify at your age now with Lear? No. One of the things that I find fascinating about the length of, t well, my age, is that the me inside hasn't changed at all. I mean, I think the me inside is about 15 years old. It's the envelope that's carrying the me inside around that simply refuses to do what I tell it. You know what I mean? My fingers won't work and you know my back gives me trouble and I lose my balance and things like that. But, and also, also the really, you know, fascinating thing I find fascinating is you, well I do, I'm not making this as a general rule for age. I, I'm so aware of how much I don't know. And I think, my God, you're so ignorant. Um, have you got time to learn? You'll have to wait and see. Benjamin Franklin, at the end of his life, gives a famous speech in which he supports the Constitution. He says, I don't agree with it, but I have learned at this age that I don't know very much, despite the fact everybody thought he was the wisest man in the room. Um, final question. What, what is your day like? What is a day like for you? Well, my day is quite normal. Um, if it's, you know, a performing day. Um, but I close the door on the world at two o'clock. Um, and that's all oh, getting ready to go to the theatre. Well, not, I don't even do that. I mean, I put my feet up. I try to save energy. But, yep, that's the beginning of my working day, really. At what moment are you Lear? You'd have to ask a member of the audience for a reply to that question. I'm too busy doing, doing it to know. Which means you <gasps> Which are. Which is a good get out, yeah. isn't it? That's excellent.